And I have the uh, honor and pleasure of being the co-director of the Rock Barn Institute, the public policy research arm of the State University of New York. And uh, a special pleasure today to introduce our speaker. I've been looking forward to this event. He's a person I've known for, actually goes way back when I was at Princeton and he worked in New Jersey. Uh, and uh, when he first came 13 years ago to be the commissioner of New York State, a distinguished public servant, a leader in the country on education policy and hard challenges that our school systems at all levels face in the country and in the world economy. The uh, topic that uh, Commissioner Mills selected for today intrigues me very much because it was his wording and uh, it is education in New York today and tomorrow. This is next month, uh, the month which, in which he will finish up uh, in his distinguished 13-year career as Commissioner of Education in New York State. When it all began, uh, he uh, asked us at the Rockefeller Institute to help him look at the department, look at uh, what was happening, and help him develop a template for the work he has done here. So we regard him as a special friend well-known in the state, well-known in the country. Uh, the commissioner is going to speak, and then he uh, said he'd be willing to entertain questions. And I don't think there's anything more I should say, except to say we welcome and uh, look forward, Commissioner, to your remarks. Thank you very much. I uh, see in the audience uh, some others who uh, were really helpful and welcoming to me when I uh, came uh, back to New York in 1995. Uh, uh, there's David Schaefer at the back of the room. He was uh, also a partner in this work uh, with the uh, uh, with Business Council. I had a friend a long time ago, a colleague uh, in another state, who was a very uh, uh, skillful political speech writer, and he said, uh, after long observation, that he perceived that there is a universal outline for an education speech at the state level. Um, some, somewhat cynical, um, uh, but a very, very fine uh, speechwriter. He said, here's the whole outline, and I give it to you. It's three parts. Nothing is more important than our children's education. We have done a lot for our children. We have to do a lot more. I am determined to give you something more thoughtful than that. There's another model that uh, I also want to avoid. Uh, at this stage in a person's career, 41 years in my case, and it will almost be 42, uh, leaders love to talk about what they did. And under no circumstances can you allow that. We'll start the questions very early if, if I lapse into that. Uh, I, I think you cannot allow it because it's immodest, it's uh, irrelevant, and it's completely unfair to the people who actually did the work. And in my case, uh, there were hundreds of thousands of people, millions when we throw in the children, who actually did the work. I think that what matters, and that's what I want to talk about, what matters is where we are, what we find in front of us, and what we intend to do, what we will do uh, with it. Management uh, guru um, Peter Drucker observed that leaders build on strength. Their own strength, he said, but especially uh, the strength of their colleagues, and perhaps most importantly, the strength in the situation. I think that there is massive strength in the situation, and very, very respectful, uh, respectable strength in, in our colleagues. And we have, to, we have to seize that strength and use it. New York is clearly at a moment of transition. And that has nothing to do with, with my departure. Uh, the title of these remarks, Education Today and Tomorrow Notwithstanding, it's impossible to predict the future. But we need to consider the opportunity, opportunities before us 
as potential foundation stones and shape them and leave them positioned so that others can build on them. Let me quickly uh, just describe where we are right now, and then I want to talk about uh, some of those foundation stones. Uh, running quickly down some data, 81% of our students meet the standards in math in grades 3 through 8, and almost 70% in English. Uh, later this week, uh, Chancellor Tish and I will present a lot more data, but that's for later in the week, not for now. Uh, on average, uh, children are uh, much better prepared for high school than they were. Graduation rates are improving. Each cohort of students seems to do better than the one before. And persistence really counts, whether it's persistence through the summer to graduate August, or persistence by uh, continuing for a fifth year. Uh, it really pays off. But still, uh, even at the, looking at the best side of it, only 73% of our children graduate from high school by the end of the fifth year. Clearly not nearly enough. New York students are second in the nation in taking SAT exams following only Maine, where they pay for the whole thing. And we're first in the nation in AP, qualifying, uh, AP qualifiers, and uh, New York had massively more uh, semifinalists and finals for the Intel Award. It's uh, really quite impressive. Today's ninth graders, kids who are in ninth grade today, are the first class to face five regents exams at 65 before they graduate, plus 22 credits. And in the early grades, we're actually nearing parity in the distribution of teaching talent. Highly qualified teachers in the elementary grades, when you look at rich districts and poor districts, it's the, gap, the gap is starting to disappear. It's another story at high school. We know the performance is up, but we also know and should talk about the fact that those performance gains are not available to every child. Now, even with the challenges, New York is commonly regarded as a leading state. And I just want to tell you something about that. It makes me nervous whenever we talk about how New York is at the top of any list. In more than 40 years, I've seen many states anointed as a national leader only to fade because they believe their own press stories. And other states were more urgent and more hungry and they passed them because they innovated. We can't afford to do that now. So let's look at our work table. I want to name a few things that I see literally on my work table and they're really on yours as well. I see state aid. I see a massive uh, infusion of federal uh, incentive uh, money, especially the money that has been dubbed the race to the top. I see new power and performance data and a dangerous gap that's been there for a long time in student achievement. I see new consensus on policy and practice. And I see enormous potential in technology. These are all likely to be transformative, and they're likely to create and shape our future. Here's how I think that could, could happen. The first, first point I would make is uh, really a question. What happened to foundation aid? What happened to state aid? Uh, the executive and the legislature were able to keep state aid level this year, but only because there was $1.1 in federal stimulus money available. They have a, a, a similar amount available next year, so it can be level again. Uh, and this is really important, because foundation is probably the, the most powerful thing, the most powerful uh, policy decision that was made uh, in the last decade. Uh, a strategy for raising achievement, closing the gaps in achievement. And yet, we may have just walked away from it, because it's not about keeping it level. We must continue to, to, to uh, uh, implement uh, the strategy. The federal funds won't be there two years from now. And even if they were to be there, have we not shifted our responsibility from the state to the federal level to carry out the most powerful strategy we have? We have a similar situation in the state education department. Uh, you know that the, the, um, the agency is funded with a mix of state aid and, uh, and 
or it's general funds from, from state sources, uh, fees from uh, licenses and so on, and federal money. But only 9% of operations in the department are, su are supported by general fund dollars. Now, there's a huge, huge federal exposure. Almost, it's approaching half of the operations paid for by the federal uh, government. And for now, the priorities of the state, the priorities of the federal uh, government and education are very well aligned. But if our priorities in the future were not aligned, would we be able to admit it, given where the money comes from? See where, see where I'm going. We have an enormous federal exposure there. For now, it's not a problem, but it could be in the future. I think in the year ahead, one really big region's challenge, and they certainly know this, is to persuade New York to continue to roll out foundation aid. There are too many students with high poverty that have too many classes taught by less than highly qualified teachers and too few graduates. And in many cases, though, those very school districts still do not spend enough to change those facts. There are very high average expenditures in the state and high average performance data in the state, certainly in many parts of the state. But the court was not misled by averages when they made, when they came to the conclusions that they did about the need to transform state aid to education. We have a great idea for Foundation Aid, and we're only a third of the way to its implementation, a little bit more than a third, 38 percent. If we don't press on, or if in pressing on we fail to achieve it, the children in the poor districts will be harmed first. But in the end, all of us will be harmed, because we're in an economy, globally and nationally, where everyone has to suit up. Everyone has to be able to engage. Everyone has to have the knowledge and skill. It's really important that that foundation stone uh, be part of what we build in the future. It's really a huge challenge. Now, challenges focus the mind and produce innovation. Embedded in the American Recovery and Re Reinvestment, uh, Reinvestment Act's 100 billion, 100 billion in new federal money over two years, for the nation as a whole, is another such challenge. The purpose is to spark radical improvements in student outcomes and to create new knowledge in school reform. Education Secretary uh, Arnie Duncan calls uh, part of that the race to the top. It's five billion, almost, and it could be actually a lot more depending on what is, is added to it. I think it has New York's name written all over it. These funds are not intended for every state, but only for a dozen or so high performers. High performers that are ready to rethink all the fundamentals, standards and assessments, P16 data systems, teaching practice, school improvement, all of that. Applications from states that are based on what they did in the past will be fruitless. Applications that are based on safe ideas will be dismissed out of hand. This is really a challenge. The challenge is very timely for New York because we are acknowledged national leaders in this state and we have repeatedly used catalytic events to drive change and to drive for high results. By a catalytic event, you know, you remember your, your region's uh, uh, chemistry. I'm sure you remember what that was. <laughs> but, a catalytic event doesn't change. A catalyst doesn't change itself, but it changes everything around it. The idea that every child should pass uh, five regions' exams, that every child should reach the same high standards, that was truly a catalytic event. And, and New York has done this in its history many, many times. While we have built strong policy and, and practice frameworks in the state at, at every level, at the, at the state level, regional level, local level, uh, and we've secured steady improvements in test scores and graduation rates, we all know when we look at the data that not every child has shared in this. And we have to make certain that they do. I talk to many school boards and many uh, board members, many superintendents who push graduation rates to 75% and they're going beyond that. 
They told me, that many of them, that 90% graduation rates are feasible. And they're committed to do that. I think we have to back their play. We have to make that commonplace. Those of you, and I look around the room, and I see you uh, monthly, many of you, in, in uh, the Regents' meetings. Those of you who follow the Regents' meetings closely know that the Board of Regents are thinking, they're thinking through every detail of reform, from standards, growth models of accountability, uh, testing, teach, teaching, and all the rest. And they're envisioning the next sequel of this, of this uh, great work. The resources that we will need to carry out the next wave of reform will be extensive, and the race to the top is one powerful source. We need to secure those resources for what we can do here. What will it require? The entry, the entry, the door of entry, I think, into the race to the top will be commitment to help create state-led national standards. State-led national standards not across the board, but in English and in mathematics. Standards that signify work and college readiness. Standards that are benchmarked against the toughest in the, around, around the world. Now, New York led in creating standards. Now, virtually every state has, has uh, high academic standards. And they're required by No Child Left Behind. We did it long before anyone required it. And New York has always been there. But now the leadership move is to lead not in creating a single set within a state, but to lead in creating state-led national standards. Not federal, but state-led. I think the, prop the, the competition will probably require a comprehensive reform package. There's some who would say, <coughs> we, ought to, we ought to put a proposal around our, our uh, terrific work in accountability. Somebody else might say we've been a long time leader in P16 data. That's not going to win it. The best data system will fail in the absence of intelligent links to teaching practice. The best prepared teachers will, be, uh, will fall short without principals who know how to sustain the conditions that teaching and learning require. I think successful race to the top proposals will tie it all together by defining relationships, and policies and practice at every level of the system. It's quite a remarkable thing how um, everyone wants to do the other person's work. It's very hard to have the discipline to say there are only there are certain things that only the Board of Regents can do, and there are certain things that only a board in a school district can do, and there are certain things that only the teachers can do. And we ought not to try to um, Neglect it, in fact, to neglect our own work and get into the work and, and block, in fact, the work of others. This is um, what I'm telling you about race to the top is speculative because, uh, in spite of many, many conversations with national leaders, they haven't yet decided how they want to do this. But I think the race to the top will probably be won by three or four consortia of states. They are determined not to give it to all states. All the states are sharing $95 billion in education money. There's this prize of $5 billion that's intended to change the conversation about education reform in this country. There has never been a Secretary of Education who, who had that kind of an attention getter. It's bully pulpit no longer. It's real money. The Regents have um, given careful attention to potential partners. We want partners, I'm not going to name them because we're still talking, but uh, we're interested in partners who are high performers themselves and gap closers. We're interested in states that have a history like New York, as, as New York does, a history of innovation, and, and other states that have really sacrificed financially, as New York has for, for education. We're also interested in, in the intangibles of leadership, bench strength in, in the um, state education department, strong relationships between a, a chancellor and a board on the one hand and, and, and a commissioner in the state education department, strong relationships, productive relationships between the board, the department, and, and the chief executive in the state and the legislature and the, and the, um, uh, the, the, the field, the school districts, and all the advocates 
uh, it takes tremendous attention uh, to um, keep those relationships strong. And we're interested in working with states that have done that. I think the ideal consortium of states would have uh, strength in every one of the major reform topics with each member of the team having outstanding capacity, truly outstanding capacity, at least one. So in other words, in every position, the, the team would have, total, have complete excellence. Uh, Chancellor Tish and I are talking to a few of the strongest states, and it's very interesting to find that they were also looking at us. We're not going to make an alliance of any kind until we know exactly how this uh, challenge will, uh, will play out, probably here in July. And um, I'm going to be cheering from the sidelines at that point. But I am utterly confident that New York will, will lead in this. The race to the top imagery is very powerful. And it's, it's important to think about what uh, Secretary Duncan means here. To extend the mountaineering metaphor just a little, over the last decade, states and school boards and schools and many national groups have positioned high base camps. And those base camps make an assault on the summit feasible. The effort is visible in the standards, in the good teaching practice, the curriculum, the data systems. But the summit represents high achievement for every child. High achievement for every child. The opportunity now is to assemble those few states that have the endurance and the knowledge and the strength and the innovation and the equipment to pioneer a route to the top. Once one team has done it, everyone can. It's essential that New York be on that team. That's what we're that's what we're intending. I'm speaking to you about transformative events and transforming, transformative uh, ideas. I, I, another one, I think, perhaps the most powerful transformative, uh, the most powerful transformer will be performance data. When we first uh, reported test scores in this state uh, by race and ethnicity, there was tremendous outrage. Many people thought it was unfair. Uh, many people. Um, put out extra editions of newspapers. Uh, it changed the way realtors uh, talked about uh, schools. But, but things happened in schools. Practices changed. The performance gap became visible, so visible that people could not look away. It was obvious that the performance was not the same for children from different communities. And then it started to change some more. When basic analysis revealed that eighth graders scoring at the lowest level on the state uh, math and English language arts exam tended to, tend to repeat ninth grade and were very unlikely to pass the regents exams in those subjects, schools changed again what they were doing. And now the proportion of youngsters scoring at the bottom level, level one, on those exams has dropped precipitously. Data showing improved performance has been one of our best arguments in, in making the advocacy for uh, increased state aid. We can actually show lawmakers that their risk was, was a smart one. And they can, we can show that uh, they, they got what they were asking for. And the data are becoming a lot more precise. And, and it's happening because states and cities and school districts all across New York and all across the nation are, are creating lead indicators, lead indicators of performance. In other words, it's too late when you have only failure of a regents exam or failure to graduate. You need to know in the, in the second grade, third grade, ninth grade of looming problems so that you can change, change something for a kid. All of that is, is starting to unfold. But even now, we can make some uh, database judgments about practice. Level one performance in the eighth grade dooms a child's high school experience. 
low literacy skills in the elementary at the end of elementary school forecast huge problems all across all across the curriculum. Uh, youngsters who have attendance rates below 90 percent are um, are facing very uncertain graduation prospects. Schools, school principals know these things and are, are changing the way they behave with their children. Now there's some, some, some big challenges in this area. Teachers are un, un, understandably skeptical when administrators try to use test scores to evaluate them. The student reads poorly in the eighth grade. Surely it's not just this one teacher. It's a whole chain of teachers, plus many different teaching methods, perhaps many different curricula, and many confounding events uh, outside the school having to do with family and community and local spending patterns. But we have to find appropriate ways to link student performance and teaching. Measuring student growth in terms of improvement from grade to grade, growth models of accountability are a major step, a very productive step. We can now do that in, in, in part with the three through eight results. And pay, pay very close attention when uh, Chancellor Tish and I present the uh, three through eight uh, English language, language arts results later this week and see what has happened as youngsters go from third grade to fourth grade to fifth grade to sixth grade. There's quite a story there. That's for later. I think this is going to unfold over decades. Um, anyone who has uh, uh, looked at the use of data in medicine or in science or in finance will understand what I mean. There will be periods when we get big jumps in improvement and then we will find that each new certainty gives way to more questions. But this is a major change in education. We have not done it this way before. Now we can. And this is transformative. I want to talk about another one of those uh, transformative issues, and it's related to what I just said. It's, it's the dangerous gaps in student, in student performance. The National Assessment for Educational Progress, NAEP, as we call it, uh, uh, produced uh, national level trend data last week. And we can see that since 2004, black students gained more than white students in the nation. Interesting. Interesting. If you use an earlier base year, go back much earlier than 2004, the gains are even more dramatic. Very interesting. So maybe it's not the kids. Maybe it's what we do. Nevertheless, in every measure of performance, there are dangerous gaps defined by race and ethnicity and wealth and disability, and they are unacceptable. And they have to be changed. The gaps are dangerous because we need everyone, as I said. Everyone needs to be ready to engage in the global economy. We need everyone ready to be a citizen, ready for work, ready for further education. I remember uh, three or four years ago now, standing in the middle of rush hour in Shanghai, very early in the morning, and there was just a massive throng uh, coming out of the distance and going into the far distance, going to work. And I realized that there were uh, almost as many people in that one city in China as, they are, as there are in all of New York State. And China can afford to get it wrong most of the time and still field more people qualified in every, in every part of the economic enterprise. We can't afford to get it wrong over and over again for particular groups of youngsters. It's not about beating the global competitor. Modern enterprise require, requires global partners, and you can't be a good partner without a good education. The gaps are also dangerous because they allow some people to set much lower expectations for some children. Sometimes they do it deliberately, not as often, but it's just as harmful when it's accidental. The most disturbing thing for me is when youngsters have internalized the negative uh, message 
about themselves or about others. I have several photographs in my office that remind me of this, and they go back through my entire career here. One is uh, a picture of a young man who uh, uh, goes back to the, to the, to the beginning of the uh, of English Regents exams for all. He was a vocational uh, school. He, he, was a, a, he was a student in a BOCES, and it was before we called it career and technical education. He was in a vocational program. And he had um, built this magnificent table. It was a historic uh, reproduction. It was inlaid. It was a work of art and craftsmanship. And I um, was talking to him. His teachers were around him. He had a big, thick notebook that he had, uh, where he had summarized and searched the drawings, the writings, and so on. And after I had admired this amazing piece of work and asked him questions, I said, um, so how do, you, how do you think you're going to do in the uh, English Regency exam um, next week? It's the first time everybody has to take it. And his face fell, and he said, oh, I, I just can't do that. I can do this. I can work with my hands, but I can't do that. And the teachers said, yes, this is unfair. But I looked down at this notebook that he just showed me, and I said, well, look at all this writing you've done. Look at this research you've done. Look at the presentations you've made, which you had to do in order to create this table. To the credit of the district superintendent, um, a year later, I was visiting the same region, and she came up to me and she said, there's somebody I need you to meet. And I turned, and it was that student. He just looked at me and he said, I passed. I have a photograph of him explaining to me, not that he passed, but that he couldn't do it. One other, uh, Chancellor Hayden, um, and I visited a school district once, many times, but on this particular occasion, and it's, it's in a photograph, there were two very, very smart young women, uh, young students, and they were explaining patiently to us that it was okay for them to have to take Regents exams, but others could not. They just wouldn't be able to do it. And if you look at the data, the performance has gone up and up. Children with disabilities, children living in poverty, uh, children of all different kinds have been able to confront this challenge and overcome it. It really is offensive when we have been so clear about the natural disability of some people, some kids, that the kids themselves actually believe. There's some other things I, I want to touch more briefly on. Uh, I think there's uh, another foundation stone. There's there's new consensus on policy and practice. I, as I look at what the states have done, a great deal is built on the consensus that we had in, in the 1980s. I think of people like Jennifer O'Day and uh, Mike Smith. The idea was that states have a particular responsibility to get a policy framework established that includes academic standards, examinations, uh, curriculum, qualified teaching force, adequate funding. That's about it. And that has taken us very far. But what's happening now is all, every piece of that is being questioned. Every piece of that is being renewed. And you see that in what Secretary uh, Duncan has um, said. Um, he says all governors, in fact, uh, Governor Patterson did this, to apply for the stimulus money, they had to give assurances, four assurances that they would produce dramatic improvements in standards and assessments, P16 data systems, uh, the actual distribution of teaching talent and school improvement. Didn't really have to tell New York to do that because that's exactly what the regents are doing. But all around the nation, people are recalibrating what the, what the policy and practice looks like. Last summer, uh, Richard Elmore, at Harvard uh, told a week-long seminar of state leaders and big city um, school leaders in two states, it happened to be uh, New York and Illinois. It was very interesting because the Chicago leader was none other than Arne Duncan. 
But he told them that, uh, our, uh, Dick Elmore said, uh, that all the results that really matter are produced far away from you guys. They are produced in, the, in this instructional core, this encounter between teacher and child and curriculum. And so what you have to do is think about what you can do to overweight that encounter in favor of a kid. As it happens, there's a huge amount that regions can do to influence the success of the common core, uh, I mean, uh, of, the, of the instructional core. They get to decide what the standards are. They decide who has the franchise to teach teachers. They decide who gets to teach. They decide what's on the test. They advocate as fiercely as they can for the money to pay for the whole thing. But they don't get in there and try to teach the child. There are also many other things that only certain other parties can do. Principals, boards, teachers, parents, lots of other people, coaches. Part of our future is going to be about figuring out who does what and staying on, on task. One last thing I wanted to mention. Uh, there's, a, there's an explosive opportunity in technology, educational technology. We have to use every advantage we have. We have to exploit our advantages if we're going to educate everyone to high, high performance. Right now, young people experience whiplash as they move from their own high-tech learning environment to the slowed-down learning environment that they encounter in virtually every school. Teachers need to, in fact, we need to join them in this they need to view their practice through the eyes of technology-savvy young people. Many teachers have taken this step. A few weeks ago, there were 8,000 teachers, mostly teachers and others, uh, in New York City taking part in something called Celebration of Teaching and Learning, and it was hugely enriched by technology. The regents have set the challenge for themselves in this area. They've said, we need to have a statewide plan for educational technology. We started by reading 10 plans from other states, and they could have been about anything. They could have been federal adult education plans. They could have been compliance plans for literally anything. They didn't sink. They were not exciting paths and maps uh, for educational technology. So we started with something different. We started with a mission, which is a promise to deliver, a vision of what could be, and a short list of outcomes. The whole thing fit on two pieces of paper. And then we proposed to take it to the field and help and literally give the pen to the people who would be affected the most, especially the teachers, especially the young people, and then all the others were gathered around. What might that vision look like? Let me describe it in the present tense as if it were already here. New learning technologies are integrated seamlessly into teaching and learning. Teachers and students don't have to think about how the technology is to be used. It's, just, it's a normal part of education, and people see that good technology leads to good educational outcomes. It includes not only schools, but all of, of uh, P16, colleges and libraries and museums and all the rest. All students have learning materials in digital form. It's there, available 24-7. It's accessible in every sense of the word. In other words, also for youngsters with disabilities. And it's not just for young people, it's for adults. Students create work products and explore mathematical relationships and find the patterns in experimental data. And they define and solve problems and evaluate complex ideas. They work with students in the next room, the next town, the next continent. The classroom and the gymnasium and the laboratory and the library and the theater and the museum are workspaces for teachers and learners. But they're not always physical spaces. Teachers share lesson plans, research-based practice. They interact with one another all the time. And they have professional development when they want it, where they want it. Kids go on virtual field trips all around the state, all around the world. They go to museums. They, uh, they 
from working with teachers who fuel the spark of curiosity by delivering just the right image at the right moment. Teachers speak of the teachable moment. Visions are powerful things, but they have to be made practical and concrete. And so uh, the regents have spelled out a few outcomes that, if achieved, would bring that vision to life. Standards-based digital content everywhere. Students, teachers, and administrators proficient in the use of these tools. The University of the State of New York using it, connected through technology, an adequate and sustainable and equitably distributed uh, funding. We're taking this on the road, we're listening, and in May there will be a first draft, and then monthly into the future, we're going to keep rewriting it and getting more and more people engaged. Let me conclude this way. Uh, these are just foundation stones. They need to be shaped. Those who come after need to find them, be able to sort among them, choose some, uh, reject others. But these are transformative uh, ideas that will help define the future. The work of envisioning the next phase of reform, I think, is well, well underway. We're very deep into the opportunities that the new stimulus money provided, and I'm confident that we will run and win uh, the race to the top. But completing the work of, of, in, of creating the, well, at least the, the, the immediate future is going to require careful transition uh, to new leadership. This is something that the Board of Regents and I promised one another almost a year ago. We know that we're doing something unusual. The usual pattern is for a commissioner to leave, and then there's a period of uh, uncertainty, even un extreme uncertainty, as a search goes on. The time simply will not allow this. We cannot have any lessening of intensity. We cannot look away from the challenges that we face. I have always envisioned leadership as a relay race. Even if a leg of the race lasts for 14 years, no one gets to run the whole distance. It's not about just the skill of the runner, it's the skill of the baton pass. It's now almost time for me to pass the baton. The regents have chosen Carol Huxley to be an interim commissioner starting July 1. I think this is a brilliant choice. I will pass the baton to her joyfully. She's grounded and practical. She understands budgets. She understands the legislative process. She's been a high school uh, English teacher. She's been a long-term member of a college board. She was a terrific de uh, deputy commissioner for more than two decades. A compassionate leader, tireless, and smart. It's important to me to be able to entrust this enterprise to someone who can lead. She will start working right beside me on day 15. And by the time she is commissioner, she'll be not up to speed. Beyond that, she'll be accelerated. I see many people here who have worked with me, some from the very first day. And I want to thank them and thank all of you. I would ask you to be part of this transition. Engage the regents. Embrace the new uh, commissioner, welcome that individual, and I ask you to dedicate your strength to help shape the children, help, help shape the future that our children need. Some questions. Uh, I'll be glad to start off with it. You can call on others. Uh, I want to ask the uh, federalism question. The, the national government and the new secretary have, uh, as you said, uh, an unprecedented opportunity, both 
for the standards that are going to be applied for the second year of the Recovery Act funding and also for the $5 billion get to the top money. Uh, I'd like to hear you reflect a little bit further uh, on what the federal government should do, can do, shouldn't do in uh, this uh, picture you so uh, uh, helpfully and effectively presented. Well, I think we're very fortunate to have so focused a, a Secretary of Education. Um, the, uh, I believe he's taken the federal role to a, a, a new and better place. Um, at least since the mid-60s, it's been, it's been extraordinarily important that the federal government has been able to point to something that is not attended to. Title I, the education of children uh, with disabilities, the education of uh, children in poverty. Um, people may want to complain about how the federal government does that, but the states, by their inactivity back then, invited it. Um, we need the federal partner. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's extraordinarily helpful right now for the, um, for, the, for the federal government to shape this huge challenge, the race to the top, but in the context of a very, very timely infusion of funding, the $100 billion. Um, I think it's important for, it's not a matter of telling the federal government what they should not do. It's about, it's about the states and the localities responding forcefully. Um, I think the, 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 the secretary is, is exactly in the, on the right uh, in the right place in saying we, we don't want to, in the federal government, define national standards. Uh, that has been attempted. It's been contemplated. It has failed. Uh, it is exactly right to have the states counter challenge. We've been challenged by the secretary to um, uh, achieve radical improvements in the achievement. Uh, the regions have been constantly uh, uh, pursuing that uh, as long as I've known them. Uh, but not everybody has been doing that uh, around the country. And now uh, we've been summoned uh, to, to push on. The appropriate response is another challenge. And uh, Chancellor Tisch and, and I were meeting with 41 states in Chicago, in Chicago a couple weeks ago where this idea of national standards was, was laid out. And you know, we spoke and said, you know, we have to do this. It is, it is the most appropriate thing for us to challenge the, the, the nation back by developing high standards. It's, uh, if states and localities go into this next period with an attitude of compliance and what do we have to do next, it would be we will get what we deserve. If, on the other hand, we say, here's how school improvement will work. Here's the, here's the research base behind it and the practice base behind it. Here's how we can get equitable distribution of teaching talent. Here's how uh, we can use data in powerful ways to expose the, the weaknesses in the system and to fix them. Um, that's the way I would um, Federalism. You know more than anyone in the room probably about this question, not just in education, but in every other field. Uh, New York has always been at the center of these arguments. You know, the Constitutional Convention in 1787 produced an amazing document, but it took Hamilton, who happened to be a regent, to argue forcefully for its passage in New York. It's not, a, it's not an accident that New York has been part of this. And we will be part of it long into the future. He knew about Hamilton, right? <laughs> Does the achieve, the achieve model uh, constitute uh, a building block? How does it relate to what you just said in uh, your comment? Well, um, there are several who thought hard about uh, what, what really strong standards should look like. Achieve is certainly one. 
ACT is another, um, the College Board is another, and the idea is that, that at least those three would put together some, um, some ideas. It's going to happen very fast. It's not something that uh, states are mandated to do. It's, um, it's, to, it's something that would be uh, proposed, and some states will adopt and others won't. Um, but it's going to happen very quickly. In July, there will be a first draft of high school outcomes. By the end of December, there will be a first draft of standards grade by grade, and uh, presumably uh, the beginnings of a curriculum framework. And then we'll all have to argue about this along the way and say, is this something that will be better for us? Uh, in those discussions in Chicago, it was very clear that um, the one thing that wouldn't be tolerated would be the expectation that a state would have to fall back and give ground. It has to be about uh, helping us push forward. That is part of the ethic here. So what's on your mind? Yes. Um, Mr. Commissioner, uh, I have um, one just comment, and then I'd ask you to comment about something. Uh, my one comment is I, I hope that this discussion will include multi multiple measures of pupil achievement. I think that these high state tests, uh, I, I think that many uh, school district superintendents would acknowledge some good has come out of them in terms of uh, getting teachers to focus on pupil achievement. That's, I think, pretty undeniable, but the, the multiple measure thing has been backburnered a lot. So that's my comment. But what I'd like to ask you to comment about is that uh, I, I'm wondering in New York about the hidden dropout rate that comes out of um, the, the high stakes test and to what extent New York is paying attention to it. I'm referring to the fact that we know that some school districts are engaged in push-up. That is, as they predict certain students are not going to be able to meet achievement criteria, pass regents exams, and so on, they're pushing students into GED programs. I think we know that practice exists on a, on a somewhat hidden level. And then some school districts also seem to have the practice of how uh, of counting data about dropouts in certain ways that don't give us a true portrait of the dropout rate. That is, if a student in some districts is not announcing that he or she is dropping out, uh, they're just um, uh, they're not counted in the dropout rate. So, can you comment about that? Sure. Uh that, those practices where they exist don't have a future, do not have a future. The last Regents meeting, uh, the, the Regents Audit Committee um, spent a lot of time pouring over uh, an audit report uh, from, uh, from the State Controller. Uh, it was about uh, a dozen uh, school districts and uh, discrepancies between the reported and the actual dropout rate. Uh, that kind of auditing is, is most welcome, and the regions welcomed it and asked additional questions. Uh, it's also uh, going to be uh, much more difficult uh, for schools to, uh, for school districts to um, have discrepancies in, in uh, reporting dropouts, whether actual or you know, whether intentional or accidental. And I'm willing to be persuaded that it's that it's accidental simply because every student has a unique ID, a unique student ID. And the child uh, uh, transferred, and there's no response from the receiving school district that the child is counted as a dropout. Um, GED is not the same as, as the graduation outcome. Um, the mere statement that the child has transferred out um, is no is no defense. That child, if they if they can't, if the district can't show that the child is received somewhere else, it's counted as a dropout. Um, the the, the uh, earlier point you made about um, multiple measures, 
that hasn't been ignored. Uh, the uh, Federal Register either just did or is about to uh, publish um, a set of um, metrics uh, that states will have to meet in applying for the second third, the last third of the, uh, of the stimulus money. And um, some of these uh, metrics are, you know, we'll, we'll look, we look at them and say, uh, we already need them. In other cases, they're, they're much tougher. And every, every state will have to invent something. Uh, the, the federal government has a habit, a uh, good one, uh, like the regions, of publishing all the data. And it's there for everyone to look at. Any kid, you know, little child who has access to a computer will be able to see quarterly how the stimulus money is spent and what the outcomes are. That's going to change uh, the argument. There won't have to be an intermediary to explain that things are better or not so well or not so good. Everyone will know. Everyone who has the interest in looking at these things. It's going to be a lot tougher to hide. Sir. Thank you very much, Commissioner. My name is Tom Gaze, the Rockefeller Institute. Um, what, the, the two big areas of reform these days are clearly going to be education and health care. And, and health, on the health care side, certainly the administration, especially the OMB, that is very interested in, um, in understanding uh, uh, medical practices um, and their comparative effectiveness. Of course, they have a major institution there um, trying to put together on comparative practices uh, at the federal level. The, I know the emphasis has been mostly on standards and outcomes, uh, accountability, but do you, what do you see either at the federal level or the state level for more, uh, for more of a focus on um, actual supporting research and diffusing research on practices um, in the educational field? Um, or do you consider that to be more of a function for the, um, not for government necessarily, but for the uh, education schools and the um, uh, uh, or, or really for the states, uh, states themselves? No. Um. I would, I think I would challenge your, your view that it's, uh, it's mostly in standards assessments and accountability. Um, one of the conditions that positions New York very well is that the regions have looked at the whole thing. They've looked at standards assessment, curriculum, uh, quality of teaching, uh, quality of leadership, and, and the, the funding to pay for this. Uh, in other words, the whole continuum. And there, there are many places where um, Regions, universities, um, and practitioners have begun to codify practice in a sense that uh, the way the med medical community has done for a very long time. For example, um, the, uh, the, our colleagues who deal with uh, the problems of children with disabilities have become quite expert in thinking through uh, practices such as PBIS um, that. Um, deal with uh, behavioral, it, it wasn't actually a special education piece, uh, idea, but it's uh, a, a, a set of <coughs> practices that can be taught and duplicated and, and, uh, and pursued with uh, fidelity in a school district so that uh, children uh, with disabilities are not, uh, uh, you know, they, they, they're, they're, they're enabled to focus on, on practice on academic uh, outcomes and there's there's not a huge number of these practices yet they're very few but once you encounter a school as I did that uh, you know, the, the basic ideas were, were summarized on a chart in every room it was almost like the Heimlich Heim maneuver in a restaurant and and the school in a very impoverished area actually had better than average outcomes for children with disabilities uh, you see, it, it, it didn't, um, there were some unfortunate things, but uh, reading first uh, was heavily focused on, on, uh, on practices. Teachers uh, participated, uh, and the administration who worked with them realized 
you can't make it up. Uh, there are there are strategies that work in teaching virtually all children to read, and it's uh, teaching is not an art form where you make it up. Uh, it is it is a profession where the, the practitioner possesses strategies that work. 